October 31 is next week. Anybody remember what happened 502 years ago? October 31? And Luther nailed his 95 theses. Fifteen, seventeen. that was considered social media posting. Nothing changes, does it? Thank you. The servant Lord tells us that we have nothing to fear except we forget how God has led in the past. So we take a short history lesson and see how God has led. Karen and I had the privilege of going on a Luther tour in Germany. And the, the best time to do that is in the dead of the winter because it's the cheapest time. <laughs> it was cold. But we stood by the Wittenberg Castle. We stood in front of the castle where he nailed his 95 pieces. There's a fence in front of it so you can't actually touch the door. And of those 95, there are two major issues that he had with the Catholic Church. And one was that the Bible is the inspired Word of God and it is superior to all human traditions. Amen. And secondly is, man is saved by grace, not by penance. Amen. Those are two major issues. Now, the Dark Ages is known as the Dark Ages because the Catholic Church forbade the reading of the Word of God. So people were thrown into spiritual darkness. The Pope had risen to a level of authority that he had been deified. And the, the priests, when they did communion, they taught that when they broke the bread and when they served the Jews or drank the, the wine, that they were recreating Christ. And the Church of Rome had risen to a place of absolute power. And what does absolute power do? Absolutely corrupts. But 150 years before the Reformation, God raised a man named Wycliffe. Now you may not know that in Orlando there is a Wycliffe Museum. Wycliffe's are known for their translations. And Wycliffe, when he, when he finally got hold of the Bible, discovered the joy of, of a living, vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and, and discovered the joy of how profound God's Word is. And he had one mission in life, and that was to translate the Bible from Latin to English. And he used the Latin <coughs> Bible as his translation, which was another rather flawed translation. As I was telling people in Sabbath school class that when Aramis translated the New Testament into Greek, actually translated the whole Bible into Greek, on one side, one column was Greek translated, translation, the other side was the, was the Latin. And the Latin was very flawed. And the word repentance, in Latin was translated penance, and thus opened the door for salvation by works. The Catholic Church did not like Wycliffe. They tried everything they could to help have him declared a heretic. He died in, in church service. He died preaching the word. Several years after his death, the church was so angry with him, they dug up his bones, declared him a heretic, burned him at the stake, and poured his bones, his ashes into the water. It's amazing. There was another reformer, John Huss, Bohemian. He also preached that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Also preached that the Bible teaches that we are saved by grace. If you look at your bulletin, and you look at the sermon title, your goose is cooked. 
John Huss's last name literally means goose in Bohemia. And so when someone would say your goose is cooked, they either know what they're talking about or they don't. Because it's a reference to Huss being buried at the stake. So next time you cook goose, just think about it. Now, when Huss was preaching, and, and all these reformers were, were Catholic priests. They were trying to reform the church, trying to bring it back to the Bible. The Pope issued a edict of excommunication to Prague, which meant there were no marriages performed, no funerals could be performed. No communion, no ordination. But the people were so terrified that they, they required us to leave so that they could be back in the good graces of the Catholic Church. In 1414, the Council of Continents. Now, the Council of Continents is where. Wycliffe was declared a heretic. And Huss goes there. He has understanding that he has a rite of passage from the emperor. But the Pope said no heretic deserves a rite of passage. And they threw him in prison. They tried to get him to recant. So they built a wall of wood around him and set it on fire. As he died, he sang, Christ, thou Son of the living God, have mercy on me. Tyndall is another great reformer. Whereas Wycliffe translated the Bible from Latin to English, Tyndall translated the Bible from Greek and Hebrew to English. The church didn't like that either. And they, they chose to also make Tyndall a martyr. But because of what had happened with, White, with the Huss, they strangled Tyndall before they burned him at the stake because they didn't want him singing songs of praise to, the, to his Savior. Now, the Tyndall Bible would be the foundation for the translation of what we call the King James Bible. And I've always held a position we really should call it the Tyndall Bible. And Luther was influenced by Wycliffe and by Huss. Now, Luther didn't want to be considered a Hussite, because you know what happened to Huss. And Luther didn't want to burn at the stake. You can't blame him, can you? Luther began studying the Bible and reading it. And Luther had a burden to translate the Bible from Greek and Hebrew to German. Luther just wanted to be an ordinary monk. But God had other plans. And God used Luther in a powerful way. Now, when you study the writings of the reformers like Wycliffe, Huss, Tyndall, the list goes on and on. All these men were wanting to reform the church. In fact, when Huss was preaching, Never Berthier had come and taken the Pope captive and the Pope died and suddenly three Popes sprang up. One of those Popes' names was John Paul XXIII. He was a terrible person. In fact, he ended up in prison right next door to John Huss. There are four major teachings that are important to us in Seventh-day Adventists that come to us from the Reformers. 
That first is sola gratia. That salvation is an act of grace. And as sinners, we do not contribute even one drop. Now, some of us struggle with this idea. When you say, what must you do to be saved? They say, well, you've got to keep the Sabbath. You've got to be kind to your parents. Be faithful to your spouse. And the list goes on and on. And the answer is always, that's wrong. Amen. Sola grasa is we are saved 100% by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing we do contributes to our salvation. And as Carl read in the scripture reading, being justified as a gift by his grace to redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Yeah. It's not a gift if we have to earn it. During the Reformation, Salvation had become a commodity. People paid to be forgiven. Some people paid for sins they hadn't yet committed yet. And the reformers were rejecting this false teaching. If you open your Bibles to Ephesians 2, Paul says, Paul talks about this concept, solar gratis, that we are saved by grace. We are saved by the faith of Jesus. Ephesians 2, this is verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Amen. We can't even take credit for the faith. Amen. Because it's Jesus' faith that saves us. Praise Lord. Verse 9, he says, Not as a result of works, so that one so that no one may boast. And then for us some of the Adventists, Paul says, for the Adventists, don't forget this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Amen. And in Romans 5, 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I remember wrestling with this when I was studying with the associate pastor from the Sanitarium Church in Orlando. The Sabbath was never an issue for me, but the state of the dead was a major issue. It took me a year, and I remember arguing with God. You know, you never win when you argue with God. And I remember saying to God, if you're wicked, you deserve to go to hell. And if you're righteous, you deserve to go to heaven. And God said to me, as clearly as we talked to each other, he said, you got it wrong. Being righteous does not guarantee you eternal life. You can't earn your salvation. Jesus has already done that. Why are we trying to undo what's been done already? Reformers taught that grace was totally sufficient to save. Repentance, not penance. And then the second one is solus Christus, which means that salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. Not anything else. I don't know if you remember when Pat Robinson ran for president of the United States. He was an evangelical. Still is an evangelical. When he was in New York, he was on, on being interviewed by a TV host. And the host said, you evangelicals believe that salvation is through Jesus. Isn't that correct? He said, that is correct. So, so what do you tell all these Jews in New York? I thought, man, this is going to be a grand opportunity for Pat Robinson to witness for Christ. But his answer was, every man must find his own way to heaven. I was so disappointed. Because Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says that salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. That's pretty clear, isn't it? The only way we are saved, even if you are a Jew in New York City, is Jesus Christ. 
Who wrote the Sabbath? I suspect there are some Adventists who think that if they keep the Sabbath, that Jesus will love them. If they keep the Sabbath, they'll go to heaven. And for some people, the Sabbath becomes a burden rather than the blessing that God created it to be. For some, for some Seventh-day Adventists, the Sabbath is kind of like the religion of the Pharisees. Jesus was doing miracles on the Sabbath and the Pharisees were criticizing for it. And in comparing them, the people were so brainwashed that when Jesus came to town, they waited until sundown to go and be healed because they didn't want to break the Sabbath. They didn't want to lose eternal life. God wants us to have peace in Christ and that's what the Sabbath symbolizes. Not salvation by works, but salvation by grace. The Bible tells us that God will have the people who will honor Him and keep His law. They will not do it to earn salvation, because that's impossible. Only the blood of Jesus will save us. Obedience as Paul said in Ephesians 2, is a direct result of a saved relationship. To say one loves Christ but rejects his law is not only impossible, but is the essence of idolatry and our anarchy. The third is sola scripture. The Bible and the Bible alone is our rule of faith. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly finished, furnished to all his good works. So what do we do with Ellen White? If the Bible is our only rule of faith, what do we do with Ellen White? Well, the Review and Herald, January 20, 1903, she said, I am the lesser light. The Bible is the greater light. Amen. Study the Bible. General Conference session, she told the pastors and the leaders, stop preaching sermons from my books and preach sermons from the Bible. The last one is, Sola de Gloria. The glory only belongs to God. See, the Pope believes that he is God on earth. When George Bush, second George Bush, went to visit the Pope, the person interviewed, the reporter interviewed him, said, when you looked at the eyes of the Pope, what did you see? He said, I saw God. All we saw was a man, a confused man. <coughs> Psalms 96 4 says, For great is the Lord, and great need to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it great to know where God of the state? Psalms 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. <coughs> no matter what life brings us, Scripture says worship God. Glorify his name. God alone should receive praise. Some people believe, well, their works help. Sometimes as Adventists, we get caught up in this idea, if I just work hard enough, I'll be saved. But that's not what the Bible says. The story is told of a little boy who was in a sandbox. And he had his toys and his front-end loaders, and he was making roads. But in the middle of his sandbox was a big rock. 
And you began the process of moving all the dirt around the rock and then trying to roll that rock out of the sandbox. He was going to build an empire. He couldn't have that rock in his place. He pushed and he pushed. He used his hands, he used his feet, and he struggled and he struggled until tears were coming down his eyes. His father was in the kitchen window. He was watching what was going on. And when he saw the tears fall, the father went outside to the sandbox and said to the boy, how come you didn't use all your strength? And the boy just cried. He said, Dad, I used all the strength I had. And the father with a smile on his face said, you didn't use all your strength. See, you didn't ask me to help you. You didn't ask me to lift that rock, to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. <clears throat> do you have rocks in your life that need to be removed? Are you discovering that really the only person you can move is Jesus? The devil tries to separate us from Christ with, with guilt and shame doubts, questions. But Jesus is the rock mover. 502 years ago when the Reformation began, it continues today. It has never ended. We are still in a state of protest. We can no longer try to reform the church. Luther told us that that's not possible. But we can still tell our family and our friends and our neighbors the people we work with God, that the Bible is God's inspired word. And that Jesus is our only hope of salvation. Don't forget the past. Don't forget these great reformers. Don't forget these, the millions of people who lost their lives defending the word of God. You may have seven or eight Bibles in your house. Read at least one of them. And it doesn't matter which translation you read, as long as it's in a language you understand. Because it doesn't do a whole lot of good to have a dozen Bibles in the house that they're not being read. And remember that no matter what the devil says to you, if he tells you you're a sinner, if he tells you you don't, do eternal, you don't deserve eternal life, you can say to him, you're right. But Jesus Christ is my God. And I know that I'm heaven bound because of Jesus. And I know where you're headed to. And I'm not interested in joining you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for these men and women who sacrificed even their lives to proclaim the infallibility of your word. And the great gift of grace through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. So before the song leader comes up, I do have one announcement for you. I was going to leave this next week, but Karen won't be here next week. So I'm making this. We've already talked to the elders about this. I've already talked to the conference. There is an expression, when a pastor comes, he makes half the church happy. And when he leaves, he makes the other half happy. <laughs> December 21 will be my final Sabbath. We're dealing with some health issues and we need to focus on those. It's been a joy and a privilege pastoring this church. Bad. Now we have a song. Boy, the joy happens, you pastor. Not anymore. I'll oh, come back. I feel good to preach once a month. I'll do it again.
have stood faithful for you. Thank you for the gift of salvation. And thank you for the ultimate price Jesus paid for us. And Lord, help us to be the kind of men and women who are kind, caring, and compassionate and share with others the love of Jesus. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.